Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about stable coins, what they are, what different types there are, why should you care, and we're gonna get into that because I think it's a really important thing from an asset protection standpoint, preventing your assets from being seized, etc. And so yeah, it's very important, stick around. I'm gonna talk about which ones are safe, which ones are not safe, uh, why they're not safe, the types of things that you're going to get around with them, and yeah, we're gonna explore that. So before we do that though, if you haven't already, please click the subscribe button. Really appreciate uh, everybody who subscribes with us. Click the notification bell to get updated on future videos. If you like this video at the end or somewhere along the way, click the thumbs up button. We like when people smash the like button. Uh, but if you don't like it, then please tell me in the comments below. Fantastic, love the feedback. And if you want help with international tax planning, how to pay the most legal amount of tax possible, uh, asset protection, uh, residencies, citizenships, forming offshore companies, opening offshore bank accounts, offshore investing, etc. Please reach out to me, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer. There's a link below or check out our website, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. Okay, with that in mind, okay, what is a stable coin? So this is kind of like part of my continuing series on the subject of cryptocurrency. I've mentioned before, uh, I think crypto and blockchain, etc. are increasingly important. So I'm talking about them because uh, number one, we're in a period of time when you're likely to do fairly well from a safety standpoint. Uh, not just safety, but like positive returns standpoint. I've mentioned before, I've allocated a bunch of my capital there and uh, I'm hoping that it's gonna do well, it could do badly. So, you know, that's always possible, but I think generally there's uh, there's some good projects out there you can do pretty well. And especially in a world where, I mean, look, Dow Jones is at record highs, interest rates are at record lows, you know, uh, precious metals are close to record highs. Uh, there's a lot of concern with people about, you know, what governments are gonna do, et cetera. The question is like, where can you put your money that's fairly safe? Where can you put your money that gets yield? Those are important topics. But in this topic, we're gonna not talk about it from an investing standpoint, uh, but this is relevant to an asset protection standpoint for sure. And that is the subject of stable coins. So what is a stable coin? A stable coin, loosely speaking, is a coin or a digital token, which matches and in theory represents uh, the equivalent of uh, some currency, typically US dollars, okay? In theory, it could be some other currency, uh, but typically US dollars. So the first major one that uh, is probably best known is Tether, okay? So what is Tether? Tether, uh, which goes by the symbol USDT, is a stable coin which is supposedly matched dollar for token to US dollars. In other words, Tether has a supply of US dollars. Supposedly, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. So if you have a tether, in theory, that entitles you to one US dollar. And so why do we have this? Uh, a number of different reasons. So first of all, being pegged to the dollar allows you to transact between coins without having to go in and out, convert from cryptocurrency to fiat and back and forth. Okay, so that's the first thing. So from a trading standpoint, if you're trading crypto, usually you're not trading, say, US dollars to uh, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Cardano or whatever, you're trading from Bitcoin to USDT, okay? And that helps to increase the accessibility, it helps to keep costs down, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is that, at least in theory, the regulatory environment and your ability to transfer money uh, is much, much easier because all I need is somebody's crypto address. There's no like checks for the most part uh, I could send somebody $10 million, $100 million. If you try doing that with banks, right? You do a SWIFT account transfer for $100 million, there's gonna be some questions. It's like, this is not, uh, this is not maybe Apple can do it without it, I don't know. But uh, for most people, you're gonna have some issues if you try to do a large transfer like that. In fact, most people, if you try doing six-figure transfers, you could have issues, right? So that in itself is a, uh, a positive factor. and. I wanna emphasize something here that I was talking with a friend who's he's kind of a Bitcoin maximalist uh, earlier today. And he's like, you know, I don't see the point of stable coins. Like you actually have more risk than you do holding fiat, okay? And to some extent he's right. So this is gonna be part of our conversation. So here's the thing. If you hold cash, one US dollar, you know that that US dollar is one US dollar, okay? That's that. If you hold it in your bank account, you know that one US dollar is one US dollar, great. If you hold one tether, one USDT, do you know that that is one US dollar? Technically not, okay? You have added a layer of abstraction because you're no longer holding your money, right? You're holding a tokenized version of your money. And there is certainly reason to believe that tether does not have enough real money to back up all the tethers, okay? 
We don't know this. That's the problem is they're, they're opaque. They're not public about their information. And so it's unclear, right? So there is a risk that at some point in the future, you could have a run on tethers and they would have an inability to pay out all the tethers. We don't know if that will happen. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it's certainly a risk. Okay, so that's kind of your first concern. And so he's basically like, look, you know, holding fiat is better than holding USDT. And I'm like, well, from a risk of the value standpoint, that is true. From the uh, regulatory risk standpoint, it is not true because it's much easier to send tethers than it is to send US dollars. On top of that, uh, how do I go and I move that money, right? If I'm saying, okay, great, I want to walk across the border, right? Well, I can't just walk across a border with a whole bunch of cash. You know, they're gonna cause me problems if I get caught. Now, people have carried, you know, in excess of the limits, but the risk is they get stopped by customs and that money gets seized. I could walk across, I, I can have, you know, my uh, cold storage wallet with me and I could, you know, the USDT is in the blockchain and I can walk across a border and that's that. I just walked across the border. Great, we're, we're good to go. Like, nobody's gonna stop me. There's nothing that they can do, et cetera. Uh, it's, they could freeze your bank account. Now, we're gonna get in a second into some problems with uh, some of these stable coins and why there's certain stable coins you should prefer, but let's just start there. Okay, so the important thing to note is that whereas Bitcoin could be highly volatile, now it hasn't been that volatile over the last while, but it could be, and it certainly has been in the past, or any other cryptocurrency could be highly volatile. In theory, this is pegged to the US dollar. So the volatility is much lower. Now, again, if it was to come out that hey, listen, Tether's a big Ponzi scheme, right? Then it could crash. Uh, there was some information a while back that they weren't fully backed. Uh, and in fact, there's even some nuances to how they figure out how it's backed today that have changed somewhat from the past. So that is a little bit complex, but anyway, uh, it didn't crash and that was, you know, something, I guess. So to some extent, it's backed by the faith that people will be able to get the backing. This brings us to another one, uh, and there's a few, okay, so, um, so whereas Tether is not very transparent, some of these others, in particular, uh, for example, USDC is, okay, so USDC, as opposed to USDT, is audited, okay, so you always know that, hey, listen, they actually have this money there, it's third party auditors, it's in reputable jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera, okay, fair enough. By the way, there's a, certainly a risk as well that even if they have the money in Tether, what happens if the government decides to freeze their accounts and seize their funds, right? You have that risk, right? So again, if you have your money, you know that you have your money. You don't know whether they have your money. And if somebody is doing something shady, right? You find out that, hey, Tether is used for Russian money laundering or something like that. There's a possibility that the government could go and go after that money. So there's that risk, right? Uh, this risk uh, in USDC, you have kind of like, you have a little bit better, in some sense it's less risky because of the fact that that USDC is audited, okay? So you have a pretty solid idea that they do in fact back every USDC token with actual dollars. So this is good, right? This is a positive thing. The problem is they're also just like more kind of under the gun of regulation. So this comes to kind of the next part of the concern, right? Which is, look, your uh, USDC, your wallet could get uh, blacklisted by them. So they, whereas the idea of Bitcoin is it's highly decentralized, right? There's no point of failure, nobody can control this. The reality is there's a centralized source that's holding the money. And so they have in the past had the ability to and have insisted on uh, freezing wallets, right? So just simply not allowing transactions to go through that are with that, uh, that wallet address and uh, requiring KYC, uh, knowing your customer, et cetera, right? So it's no longer anonymous the way that uh, Bitcoin is sort of pseudo anonymous, right? So that's something that is a little bit uh, worrisome, right? So I would generally say Tether, not the biggest fan, USDC, not the biggest fan, Let's talk about, and by the way, there's a few others, right? Like there's a bunch of different stable coins that all kind of follow a similar model. We're gonna talk about the third type, which is the part I've mentioned in a previous video about DeFi and what is DeFi, uh, and that is DAI, 
Okay, so this is what we call an algorithmic stablecoin. So now we've seen the rise of algorithmic stablecoins. What are algorithmic stablecoins? These don't rely on being backed on anything in the real world. They're backed by crypto. Okay, so basically there is a basket of crypto assets and uh, the vault, based on the, the variance uh, in the value of those cryptos, they will issue more or less uh, what are called DAI. And DAI is this algorithmic stablecoin which then makes sure that it's gonna match approximately the price of USD. It's a very, very cool thing, okay? It, I, I believe they're supposed to be somewhere between 0.95 and basically it's a, a five cent plus or minus variation off the US dollar. So it can fluctuate somewhat, but not a lot, right? Very, very interesting thing. So DAI is much more decentralized. It's much harder to control. And as a result, I think if people care about protecting their assets, to me, it's a much safer thing. Now, there's a possible risk that if the price of Ethereum, because Ethereum is, represents, I think it's like 60% of the backing of DAI, if the price of Ethereum was to massively collapse, right, you were to see like an 80% drop, it is possible that you would not end up with your full value of DAI. So that's a possible concern. Uh, how much of a concern? Hard to say, right? Uh, to me, I would rather take that risk. I'm more confident in kind of the basket of backing and things like this than I am in somebody like, I don't like organizational risk. To me, organizational risk is part of what you're trying to get away from when you do crypto. So here, there's no regulatory body that's gonna step in to say, hey, listen, you, know, you need to show KYC. There's no regulatory body that's gonna say, hey, that wallet address is blocked. There's no regulatory body that's gonna come in and say, hey, listen, we're gonna freeze the bank accounts of the institutions holding this. It's not held by an institution. It's held in smart contracts, okay? So there's some sort of, basically what's happened is that assets in the form of, again, various crypto assets, but typically Ethereum, uh, are stored in a smart contract. And then that creates what we call minting. They mint DAI, and then it basically balances accordingly. So it's all just done in code, okay? So it's not like there's somebody who's holding that crypto who you can go and say, okay, great, let's seize that crypto from them. No, that's not the way that it works. And uh, so in that sense, it's much more decentralized. It's much less susceptible to control. There's, of course, there's always ways that, you know, hypothetically, somebody could hack something, somebody, you know, but the likelihood that that happens is quite low. Uh, I would say far lower than the concern of A, uh, that Tether is gonna get into some trouble, or B, that USDC is going to have some issues, okay? So that's my basic recommendation. I hope that kind of makes sense that these coins uh, are called stable coins because they're, they remain stable with a value of a fixed asset, typically US dollar. Uh, there's now stuff where they're using stuff based on gold uh, and kind of gold equivalents, uh, some other currencies as well. There's various other uh, algorithmic stable coins. There's various other uh, stable coins that are backed by say US dollars, et cetera. And so, you know, that's a whole other, whole other conversation. But yeah, that would be my general, first of all, my explanation, I hope it made sense for you. And second of all, my recommendation when you have the chance, and it's not always possible when you're talking about trading. So if you're talking about trading volume, most of the volume is on Tether. So you're gonna be trading in and out of Tether. That's just the way that you're gonna go. But if you're actually saying, hey, listen, I wanna have money with me that I'm gonna keep safe, I'm going to you know, be able to protect it for me, then DAI would be, at least for myself, where I would recommend putting it. And then from there, you can use it to buy you know, various different other crypto assets and trade in and out of it. So anyway, hope that helps. Uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please click the subscribe button. We would love that. Click the notification bell. And like I said, if you're interested in international tax planning, how to pay the most amount of tax legally possible, uh, asset protection, subjects like this, but you know, other broad legal structures, et cetera, uh, forming offshore companies, opening offshore bank accounts, residencies, citizenship, second passports, uh, international investing, et cetera, please reach out to me, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer, link below, or check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitals.com. I will see you guys on the next video.